Wranglers, welcome to this Saturday morning. Oh my gosh, look at that, uh, look at that stark, stark lighting. All right, we're going to be doing this lighting today. But uh, hey, we are here talking about uh, baby, keeping baby chameleons outdoors. And uh, yeah, it, it's come more and more people are dealing with baby chameleons. And uh, and by baby, I'm not talking about the three to four month old panther chameleon that you get well established from a breeder. I'm talking about when you're surprised by Jackson's chameleon babies, when you go to a show and you buy an egg and well, lo and behold, it hatches. And what do you do now? And so uh, I've been doing some more focusing on uh, the, the younger babies. Uh, than uh, three to four months old. Once they're three to four months old, honestly, they're uh, well on their way to taking care of um, being <laughs> being as uh, hardy as an adult. Uh, so it's the the reason why they're sold later in life is because it is uh, they're a little bit more delicate at the uh, earlier stages. So, uh, but hey, we are going to. Uh, I, I love I love uh, working with baby chameleons. And if you have the chance and you enjoy working with baby chameleons, well, today we're going to be talking about how to house them outdoors. And uh, this is a live chat, so you are welcome to uh, uh, write something in the chat and uh, and we'll just uh, uh, interact here because this is a live back and forth. Hello, Power Hustler and uh, Hamalorian. If I were to keep my veiled chameleon in an outdoor enclosure all day, but move her into a... Well, wow. Hello, Juan. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Hamalorian's got the, already got a question, but uh, talking about a female veiled chameleon in an outdoor enclosure all day, but move her into a separate enclosure in my house at night. Would that be too stressful? I have rats where I live. Uh, that all depends on the uh the personality of your veiled chameleon uh some chameleons are fine being uh, moved back and forth uh every uh, uh come out in the morning and out during and back in uh, go out during the morning and come back in during the night uh, i certainly did that with a lot of my chameleons um <laughs> i did that a lot before i realized that a cold night was actually good for chameleons uh, and so it depends on the personality. If they're stressing out every time you try to get them out of their cage, then it, it can be a problem. But if they're calm about it, you can do it. Uh, as far as rats, yeah, you just got to decide, uh, maybe do some test, put, put a cage out and see, and put food in it, put crickets and stuff in it and see if there's any problems. Um, I mean, that, that's a way, one way you can test it. I have rats around where I am, and the only time I've ever had a rat get into a cage is when I had all of my cages packed together in the garage because the, the weather was getting into the 30s, and um, and I guess the rats were going for some crickets that were left over in there, and so they uh, they, uh, they they got it they uh, bit through the cage and they got in. So uh, that is something to be concerned about. But uh, strangely enough, I've not had that happen outdoors. No. Uh, let's see. Hello, one. And actually made a presentation for you all. And uh, but it's just having a little bit of a trouble loading up. So we're going to be <laughs> I'm going to be dancing on screen for a little while until that thing comes up. Um, but. This is why we're talking about this is because being outdoors, it's almost magic for chameleons, for uh, it, the, the natural sunlight, the, uh, the, the breezes and the uh, ebb and flow and humidity. It's amazing what happens when you have your babies outside. Um, one, uh, they got someone from Facebook asking, what temps are you comfortable with keeping your babies outdoors, highs and lows? Uh, that does depend on um, on the the species, but most of them I let them get into the 50s, and I got no problem with that. I start talking, I start uh, being concerned when it gets into the 40s. Now, but the thing is, 
the important thing is not the nighttime low. It's really, is the daytime clear? If you have a clear daytime and this uh, chameleon is going to be able to bask in the sun, the, the nighttime low 50s, even the 40s, isn't that big of a deal because the chameleons are ectothermic. And so they just, their body just slows down. I mean, the colder it is, the more restful of a sleep they're going to get. Obviously, you start getting in, well, not obviously, but you start getting into the 30s and getting close to freezing. And you're looking, starting to look at cellular damage unless there's you know, special powers within the chameleon. There are some, uh, there are some animals that have like antifreeze in their blood, but, uh, but, chameleons don't. So we don't let them get down that low. But the important thing is, is can they warm up during the day? And if they can warm up during the day, the nighttime lows are really not a problem at all. Um, let's see. Power Hustler has three females and one male. Ooh, <laughs> Power Hustler, you better watch out. You get those females gravid and uh, you're going to have a lot of babies. Um, hopefully. Oh, okay. We got some people. Hello, Neptune. Uh, you know, we got some, some panther chameleons coming in. Um, oh, good question. Someone from uh, Facebook is asking how hot is too hot. And, uh, that actually it, it's, uh, you know, it's, depending upon the species, of course, uh, Jackson's chameleons are much more sensitive than say panthers or even veils, which is crazy because veils are a higher temperature than uh, our higher altitude than Jackson's chameleons. But uh, generally start getting into the 80s. Uh, that's uh, high 80s is getting, you're getting into a danger area. 90s is real trouble. Uh, thing with baby chameleons is they just have such a small body that uh, they're going to dehydrate quickly. And this is exasperated. It's not just temperature. It's also if the sun is beating on them. Uh, if they are in the shade, uh, if their cage has shade, then they can handle higher temperatures because they just go into the bush. It's just like they do in, in Madagascar. I mean, we look at the temperature ranges in Madagascar and it's, oh, okay, they like the 90 degree. No, no, no. That's what the weather station says, but they're hiding in the bush. They're hiding away from that. And so if we give them that uh, ability to hide and get away from the um, uh, sun, then they're going to be able to uh, be able to uh, uh, be safe, even though the temperatures are high. And this is why it becomes very important whenever we take a cage outside that we don't just use our indoor cage and put it out there. Uh, first of all, the plants are going to just burn and uh, because the sun is just so powerful compared to our lights. And if you have a clear floor, the sun bounces off that floor and uh, and up into the cage. And so the chameleon is getting it from the top, from the bottom. And so uh, it, there's no protection or way to get away from the sun. So this is why we've got to uh, make sure that the inside of the chameleon cage that's out that's outdoors is a sanctuary. It's a protection from the sun. I mean, I know indoors, we spend so much time trying to light our cages and get our cages as bright as possible where we haven't uh, developed the skills of, wait a minute, hold off. That's too much light. Uh, but that's what you get at the sun. And that's why a soil floor is so important. A larger cage than you would normally use indoors is uh, very important. Uh, and a thick foliage so they can get away. And here's where, um, <laughs> interesting, I was comparing and contrasting the uh, Reptibreeze 24 by 24 by 48 inches versus the Exoterra 36 inch uh, wide by 18 inch deep by 36 inch tall. Indoors, both of those are equivalent. Those Both of our, those will work just fine. Outdoors though, uh, you got to be a little bit more careful because the Exoterra, which is only 18 inches deep, if you have an adult cage, uh, adult chameleon in there, that may not be enough uh, foliage cover uh, to protect them from the sun. So you need to be very careful when you start getting into those thinner cages if you're doing it outdoors. Uh, let's see. Okay, we, we have some... Uh, Talking about the highs, a uh, big concern right now is the heat and direct sunlight for my baby panthers. 
Yes, especially during summer, that is a very good concern. Uh, direct sunlight, me with my babies, I only allow direct sunlight up until at, mo at, at most 10 a.m. After that, they're completely covered. I have a cover or they're in the patio or they're shaded. Uh, I, I sometimes put a bunch of cages on a rack that has wheels and I move that around. But you got to be careful when you're dealing with babies is that that direct sunlight is a killer, a literal killer. Uh, the babies just dry out so quickly and they, they don't have the body mass of like an adult that can uh, that handle that. So uh, be very careful. All it takes is 15, 20 minutes of direct sunlight that they can't get out of and your baby may not survive. So uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, and, and the way to take care of this, it's, it's uh, strange to think about something so deadly, but it's so easy to take care of that. And that's just a thick layer of foliage. And I mean, this is what they do in the wild. And so they can, um, they can survive it. You just got to give them what they need to uh, deal with the situations. Um, let's see. I have uh, Chicago Loso saying my veil is very aggressive because he was bitten on his back by another veil that's a baby, but I like his aggression. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, uh, uh, chameleons have childhood trauma as well. Uh, that that is part of it. So, well, I'm disappointed that my my uh, uh, what I had put together, uh, my presentation just isn't coming up. But um, you know what? Give me a second here. I, I know this is really bad uh, for for video, but I am going to try to uh, open this in a tab and do this a different way because I'd really like to uh, have some visuals on this. So let's see. All right, watch this, people. I am... I'm going to try to do a screen share. There we go. Look at that. We're going to try that. All right. So this is a, a real fun project that I came up with uh, as a way to deal with uh, keeping babies outdoors because I do like to. Oh, my goodness. This is going to be crazy. OK, this is, people I'm going to have to gonna be a lot of fun. I'm not going to be able to see the, uh, the chat for a little while, but uh, there we go. So. The latest podcast, I just talked about how to do this uh, uh, this caging system. And what I do is I take that wonderful Rep to Breeze 16 by 16 by 30 that we, <laughs> it's in the kit that we all hate. And I put on a, uh, I just threw soil in the bottom. It's, uh, it's really interesting how you can uh, do that. Uh, it's not, there we go, there's a soil in the bottom. Uh, the uh, the uh, the screen holds in the soil just fine, and you can give your, get yourself a nice four to six inches uh, of the um, uh, of soil in there, and just plant plants directly in it. And the only um, oh, oh, Emerald Garrett saying I am out of focus. People noticing? Am I still out of focus? Shouldn't be, uh, but. Uh, yeah, let me know if uh, if if we're uh, if I'm still out of focus. But uh, one thing I found when I did this, and it, it all of, if you guys been following my YouTube channel, you know I did this last year, and I did something just like this. But what I found was that it was difficult to uh, the soil would dry out so much, and so what I did is I just put coroplast over uh, over the sides. And so now you have a, a coroplast uh, uh, planter box. Now, uh, the coroplast doesn't have to be strong enough to hold in uh, any soil because the screen is doing that. The screen is, uh, is strong enough to do that. And so all the coroplast is doing is keeping in the moisture. 
And so the plant is going to have a much easier, <laughs> much easier time to, um, uh, to, to keep their, the moisture that they've got. Now, uh, I think you all need to take a break and see Emily. That is uh, Emily, the uh, jeweled chameleon. And one, one thing that's great about this is you can see that uh, she even has some blues coming in. Um, but that is uh, not what we're talking about right now. I just put that in because uh, I love her very much. <laughs> well, what I had, did do is uh, I put together some uh, a template for uh, uh, that you could download. It's on the website. And it, uh, it just has all the cutouts, so you can put on this, uh, cut out this coroplast without, uh, and still have the functionality of the screws and uh, the latch. Uh, and so you can download that and print it one-to-one. -one. And you can easily do a cutout. Just remember to uh, mirror the cutout. Uh, let's see. Facebook user says, did you know XL Repto Breezes for perfect, perfect on top of, let's see, let's try that. Um, yes. Uh, what this person is saying is that the uh, XL Repto Breezes, the 24 by 24 fit on top of the utility sinks that you get at the home improvement store. And uh, that gives you a nice little planter box. Yes, I did know that. And I've used them. Uh, very much, but uh, I will say the one problem with doing that outdoors is you have to make sure that the uh, that you protect the reptibris from the sun. And what I mean by that is uh, the reptibris two by two by four is not big enough uh, to be able to really give you total protection against the sun. Of course, it depends on where you are uh, in Southern California. The two by two by four foot cage is not big enough to really effectively uh, protect the chameleon from the sun because all the all the four sides are uh, give you exposure, and so you don't you're not able to really close in an area, which is what you need to get that real shaded area and and uh, and cultivate the humidity from the bottom. And so, if you're going to do this, the thing is when you do it with a tub. It, it can't, it's very difficult to move it and it's heavy. And I know I've tried, I've dragged these things around, but uh, so, but it will work if you plant plants all alongside it. And so the sides and the back are protected from the sun. That makes it work. Uh, you'll find next, uh, next week, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I, uh, the planter box cages, which is essentially what I do is I create a, uh, a, a, uh, a box made of wood, but this is on wheels. And so I literally roll these things around all over the place. It gives you that, uh, that soil floor. Um, but we'll say uh, it's very convenient to use utility tubs uh, or the uh, utility sinks because uh, this user is right. The, uh, the cages fit right on it. You just put them on it and uh, you can actually screw it down to the uh, utility tub. Uh, let's see. Jennifer's asking, do you have the brand name for the safest soil? Uh, I don't. And really, I have used just organic soil from the home improvement store. I haven't gotten very deep into uh, doing the absolute best uh, soils. The, uh, the soil that I, I get a nice organic soil, just like a potting mix. And I put it in the cage and I know this potting mix is fine because uh, anything that I pot outside with this mix, isopods will, will start congregating in it. And so I just assume it's just fine. And if I'm going to do bioactive in this, which outdoor things end up being bioactive, uh, then it's, uh, isopods are the ones that are going to be using. So uh, it, it's been safe for me, but unfortunately I don't, I haven't dived into it enough to really get one specific brand to recommend, but that's something I need to do. So yeah, it's on my action item list. Um, here we go. We have a question. How do you attach the coroplast? 
All right, let's see if I have, I should have pictures here. Um, uh, can you see? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, you can see. I think it, you can see. If you look closely enough, it's screws. I just get uh, stainless steel screws, number eight stainless steel screws that are half inch long. And uh, I, I, you can see, I don't know if you see the two on the top and the one on the bottom. I just drive it directly through the coroplast into the aluminum frame. Here I can go. This is uh, my shopping list here. So those, that's a, a picture of the screws that I use. And uh, they just, I just forcefully turn it through the coroplast. It's very easy to go through and then into the aluminum frame. And it's the same thing as when we're putting together a, uh, a hydration mount, misting wedge or the dragon ledges. You just go directly into the, uh, the aluminum. Uh, and then, uh, and so if you're in, in my explanation and the, uh, the podcast episode where I talk about this, uh, you can just go to the website, the chameleonacademy.com website. And I have this menu item say, uh, called projects and just go, go under that. And there's the bioactive stuff that I've been talking about. And there's these uh, outdoor baby cages. So, uh, that that's an easy way to find, find uh, find this project. Well, that, that's my little Jackson's. Uh, let's see. Oh, and Jennifer says, looked at organic soil, got scared that some might have extra chemicals. That's a problem. We don't know everything that's in there. And honestly, I can't tell you, even if I did see chemicals, I don't know enough about the soil to know if they're dangerous. And so, I mean, really all I've been able to do is take a look at when I use the soil out, outside in normal potted plants. Does life arise within that pot? I'll put leaves on top of the pot. And if, if within a couple of weeks, I should be able to take off those leaves and find earwigs and isopods and uh, and other life. And, and so that's, that's my test right now. It, it seems a little bit of a haphazard test, but uh, that's all I've got right now. So let's see. Um, here's a good question. Uh, Sean is asking, do you not put the cages in direct sunlight all day? I live in Texas and would like to move my chameleons outside. No, I do not. Um, for cages this small that I'm talking about right now, they're not big enough to ward off the sun all day. And so I only allow them direct sunlight during uh, the morning hours uh, when the chameleon's warming up and then it's covered, shaded. Uh, I, If I am going to have a cage that is... Um, directly in the sun all day, that's going to be a three to four foot wide, six to seven foot tall, three to four foot deep, big enough cage that I can really plant it and that the chameleon can get in the center of it and be completely shaded over, uh, over uh, moist soil. And it, it actually gets pretty cool in there. I'd like to go sit in there on a warm summer day. So that's that's what it takes to create the uh, the microclimates when you're dealing with something as powerful as the sun. But these guys in these little cages, no, they they just get uh, direct sunlight in the morning and sometimes uh, in the uh, evening when the sun is setting. Uh, hello, Colt, first time viewer. By the way, everybody, I don't know if you can see this. I just got just trying out some new colors with the Chameleon Academy t-shirts. And uh, if you're interested in getting one of your rainbow panthers uh, uh, on your shirt, you can go to the academy.com website and uh, go to there's a little store link that you can buy these t-shirts. And um, I, I'm getting one per day. And you can also get uh, these, these uh, coffee cup mugs. Kind of nice. Love the. Uh, that's the one thing. If you're gonna do a, an outreach like this. Get a logo that you really like, <laughs> and 
uh, it, it's worth it to pay a professional and say, help me with this. And so, uh, because I love putting it on t-shirts and stuff. It's all over. So the question is, uh, has anybody here uh, tried to put uh, chameleons outside? What are your experiences? Uh, have you had experiences? I mean, we, we talk a lot about the sun and the sun is uh, our number one concern when it comes to keeping babies or chameleons outside. Uh, but there's also other considerations, predators. And predators can be anything from a raccoon breaking into your cage to ants uh, swarming your cage. Um, and those ants are horrible. Uh, once they start swarming, even if they've come just for the crickets, uh, the, that may be a dead body of a cricket or something, they will run into your chameleon. And if you're talking baby chameleons, it, it can get really ugly fast. So uh, ants are definitely a concern. The, uh, the whole idea, uh, I mean, if you can put it on a stand or something and or you're using your utility sink, you can always put uh, little saucers of water under there and that'll protect from the, uh, uh, from the ants. Uh, so it's important and it's worth doing. Now, let's see. Um, Colt uh, 45 is saying, uh, <laughs> wait, wait, well, first, <laughs> Leap with the Eyes is saying, a new mug. Yes, it's a new mug. For the, all of you who were on my Instagram live, you know I broke my last mug and I was very sad. Uh, but yes, I was able to get a new mug and I'm very happy about that. Um, Cold 45, a Rain Man 88 is saying uh, the veiled, their veiled chameleon is outside 24-7. Uh, it's amazing if you are, there are so many areas that a veiled chameleon can live outside. And there's rumors of a group that live outside in the area that, that I'm in. Uh, I had nothing to do with that, by the way. And uh, so they do... They do find in a number of areas, especially if you're in Florida, Southern California. Uh, Veilds can be outside year round. Jackson's chameleons as well, if it doesn't get too hot. Um, and, and But I wanted to say just a, another note. Uh, we need to be careful, even if we're in an area where they are naturalized. Like right now, Veilds can live outdoors where I am year round. Uh, and then the people in Hawaii, They've got Jackson's chameleons all around, but things change when you put them in a cage. So you need to be careful that you don't think just because the chameleon lives naturally around you that putting them in a cage, you don't have to do anything. The problem is that the conditions that those chameleons live in day in, day out will kill them if they're not allowed to get out of them. And so when we put them in a cage, we restrict their movement. And that is, that is life-threatening. We have to be aware that in the natural environment where they come from, they will die if their movement is restricted. And that's what we're doing with the cage. So um, just because you've got chameleons outside where you live and you find them in your backyard uh, doesn't mean that it's all free sailing. You got to understand what you're doing. Um, Let's see. Emerald Garrett saying both of mine live outside. Excellent. The girl's demeanor has completely changed. She's actually tame now after five years. Really? <laughs> Being outside uh, made that change, huh? Let's see. Um, one thing wants to see. Uh, Leaf with eyes is talking about uh, their ustaletai. With Drexel, yeah, Ustalai is a good one for outdoors. Uh, they're they're pretty hardy until 10-ish and shade rest of the day. Bring them back inside the night. That works. That works. Now, I do want to start talking about plants in here. And it, plants are a little bit of a challenge because you're talking about, if you're using the cage that I'm talking about, it's 30 inches tall and you've used up six inches of uh, soil. So you've got a 20 inches of the plant. And any plant that's going to have a lot of foliage probably is going to get bigger than 20 inches. So all of these plants that I'm using are going to outgrow my cage and I'm going to have to do a lot of trimming. And if you don't, I know you, uh, you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, 
but if I let it get all bushy, then doesn't that create a good dark inner circle uh, where a chameleon can hide? And you're right about that. But the problem is that whatever parts of the plant aren't getting light die. And so you end up having this shell of a plant around the middle, and which is still effective. But the problem is when you stop its growth, uh, it, the plant starts to self-destruct if you let that go on for too long. Um, and so uh, you got to always uh, keep on to the trimming there. Um, let's see. McZoo, Exotic Pets. Oh, he's got the new logo. Congratulations, McZoo. Everybody, take a look at that new logo. Uh, sun is awesome. Predators suck. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Tried to make mobile indoor-outdoor cages without good luck. Need different parameters. Yes, that's an excellent point. Uh, the most successful I have been is when I have an outdoor cage and an indoor cage per chameleon. And I cultivate the indoor cage with the indoor plants. And then I cultivate the outdoor cage with the outdoor plants. And then uh, if I have to move the chameleon back and forth, like on my panthers, I don't like to leave my panthers out during the winter. Uh, I don't get snow. Uh, my winters get into the high 40s. So I know when I say winter, some people have a different idea of what, what I'm talking about. Uh, but so I don't leave my panthers out. But I don't it just doesn't work to try to have one cage that uh, that is both indoors and outdoors. And so uh, I have been the happiest in my chameleon keeping uh, history when I have two cages per chameleon. <laughs> I know you keep hearing me say one cage, one chameleon per cage. Well, you know what? It's even better if you do one per chame one chameleon per two cages. So it works out really nice. Let's see. Um, any other? Oh, but I wanted to. Uh, let's see. To do, do, do show you a neat little trick. Let me find it right here. There we go. If you have a plant that is nice and has foliage, but it's not big enough to get fill up the 20 inches of cage, you can add another six inches by keeping the pot. And what I do is I just get a utility knife. I cut off the bottom of the pot and put that on top of the soil. And so, hey, you know, I... I uh, release the roots at the bottom, but then when I put it on top of the soil, there's another five to six inches of soil that the roots can go into, and I, I get that initial height. So uh, this is a picture of a cage that uh, that I was working on. Uh, I didn't put on the coroplast, so it's a lot easier to see the, uh, the soil, but uh, I have one vine that's a bower vine that's planted, and then my Japanese boxwood, I just cut off the bottom of the pot and then plop that right on top of the soil. And so I have this nice multi-level uh, multi -level effect there. There we go. We'll have that as a nice... Uh, um, what I do after I put it in the soil and I put on the core last is I put in a leaf layer. And that, uh, that keeps moisture in as well as far as the... Uh, uh, for the cage and for the plants. And it's uh, been working quite nicely. Um, you'll notice in these pictures, there's also, there's a bowl of fruit. And if you look carefully, you'll see some rotten or some very ripe bananas. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm harvesting and uh, the fruit flies swarm and the babies eat the fruit flies. Uh, and it's a an easy source of a lot of food. So, um, I do that, and and I always supplement. I always feed them the flightless fruit flies, the black and the golden, and crickets when they can. But if I keep in those, uh, keep in that, uh, that fruit, they get a, a wide variety of the wild nutrition. So uh, I really like doing that. Um, my one concern about doing that is that could attract things like possums, uh, but I haven't had a problem in the. I, I've never had a problem with a possum or a raccoon breaking into these things. I'm not going to say it'll never happen, but 
of the 10 years of me doing this, I just haven't had it happen. Now I have had a problem when a chameleon hangs on the side of the cage and sleeps there. Then I, I have had uh, critters try to get at that chameleon, but, um, but I haven't had them try to get in to get the fruit, which is strange. But anyway, it's worked very well for me. And uh, I'd like to just uh, share that technique with you and uh, let you make the judgment as to uh, what is uh, what is wise in your area. Um, I did I was talking with somebody who has bears in his area, and uh, the bears had learned to check out anything that was man-made. So, that was not a really good situation for outdoor caging. Um, so everybody's got their own situation that they got to deal with. Um, oh. Let me just take a look at some of these uh, comments here. Christian is saying, is there any extra treatment for high pied translucent veil chameleons in full outdoor cage? Not that I know of. I know we all look at that, uh, the uh, translucent, and they say, oh, you must be albino, and so you must have a uh, sensitivity to the sun and UVB. Uh, I haven't heard that this is the case. So, uh, but the thing is, what we're doing here is we're creating an environment and a system for the chameleon to be able to choose where they want to be. And so your cage for a normal colored veiled would be the same for a pied veiled, would be the same for an albino veiled. I, we don't have an albino veil. I've never seen an albino veiled. But if we did, one that was sensitive to the sunlight, we'd give them the same type of cage because every single chameleon needs to be able to get fully out of the sun. And how much they stay in the sun and how much they stay in the shade is up to them. So that that's the key to chameleon husbandry uh, is not taking care of the chameleon. It's taking care of the environment so the chameleon can take care of themselves. That's, that's what we need to strive for. And that that's where we're going to find success. See power hustler is saying they live in Florida and the climate is almost perfect year round for outside chameleon time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and all the, uh, all the wild veils and uh, panther chameleons will uh, agree to that, uh, depending upon where you are in Florida. But uh, yeah, yeah, Florida's good. California is not as good as Florida, but we still have some feral populations here and there. Uh, at least rumors. Uh, I haven't seen them. I've heard about it from some uh, reliable sources, but I haven't seen them myself. Matthew's saying, had a baby Jackson's, now uh, uh, 1.3 years old, never been inside. Saw temps down to the high 30s and never stopped eating. Yeah. Uh, Jackson's, Neelii, Veils, all of the, these have no problem. Uh, even high, I, I will say high 30s, I allow them to go down there. Uh, I just don't let them get near to uh, 32, which is our freezing point. Um, although I have heard stories of uh, chameleons that were uh, overnight ice storm and they uh, wake up, uh, the people wake up in the morning and find them half frozen in puddles on the ground, uh, assume they're dead, but uh, during, but by time afternoon comes, they're up back up into the trees. So um, me saying that, uh, I don't let them get near the freezing point. That's not because I don't know that they, uh, that's not because I know that they won't survive. It's because I'm being very careful. I don't know what they can take and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to overstep what I know. Um, very important that, uh, that, uh, that we know our limitations of what we know and don't go beyond that. And I, I don't know how close and past freezing a chameleon can recover. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, anybody, the thing is, if you get into the high thirties, as long as the day is, uh, is clear it with sun, it's not a problem at all. Uh, the chameleons just warm back up. The problem is if say you're in, uh, an area of Washington, the Pacific Northwest, 
and you have lots of cloud cover and the chameleon isn't able to warm up during the day, that's when it starts to become a problem because um, the problem is not that the low temperatures are causing a problem. It's that uh, so they get a lot of restful sleep. They just aren't able to function at full efficiency when they are awake uh, to process, you know, the organs and processing digestion, all that kind of stuff. They don't, they can't reach that, that, uh, that, that status of, uh, of functionality. And so that's when it becomes a problem. A couple of days, not a problem, but after that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not here to test what chameleons can survive. We're trying to keep them healthy within a reasonable, uh, ebb and flow. Um, but I will say, uh, it is common and we know it works to give chameleons the perfect day or idealized conditions 365 days a year. But um, we're finding that it's actually healthy for the chameleons to have a downtime. And, and we're exploring just uh, what's because it, there, there, is, there is health to be found in, um, in stress. And I got to be really careful how I say that. But uh, we, our bodies are actually designed to deal with stress. And so, um, yeah, we, th there is some health benefits to stress and, uh, I'll just leave it at that because, uh, there, there's, I have absolutely no way to, uh, describe or know just how much stress is good and that at what point it starts to become damaging. Uh, where that line is, I don't know. Uh, I won't. <laughs> won't won't uh, pursue this thought publicly uh, for a while. Um, yeah, let's see. Have uh, Colt is sharing. Spends outdoors of a five hours outdoors with uh, with the chameleon in a tree. Okay, it sounds like you get you offer water insects through the day. Missed him. That's perfect. Um, <laughs> as long as, uh, but everybody be careful if you're putting your chameleon in a tree. Uh, they they move slowly when you're watching, but as soon as you turn your eye or get distracted by the latest TikTok, mm, that chameleon says, "Okay, it's time to book it." And although you'll always win the. Uh, the running race with them um all it takes is a couple of minutes and boy they are gone uh they're they're pretty good at that so um outside yeah just be careful uh also a note for people who want to keep them in trees outside uh beware of birds and birds of prey uh that will come down and they will snag your chameleon if they can uh it's rare because the birds are also noticing you and they're not really keen on uh, being around when you're around. Uh, so they're cautious about that. But I do remember a story of someone who had to watch their chameleon be carried off by a hawk because uh, uh, the conditions were just right for the chameleon, the, the hawk to do that. It's probably a falcon, though. I don't know how many. Well, there are some hawks that will take things out of a tree. So. Let's see. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Daniel lost an iguana to an owl. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, that is, you know, we don't necessarily think about these things, but when it happens, ouch. Ouch. Let's see. God's demon. Oh, wait a minute. I recognize that. <laughs> Have you been here before? Is there a liquid vitamin supplement that you can use in a Mr. Dripper rather than powder on the market? If so, how often would you use it? I don't know if there is. Uh, I've never worked with something like, like that. Uh, question is, why would you want to do that? And go ahead, uh, put it in a, uh, go ahead, put it in the chat. What, what is the advantage? What advantage are you looking for to bring vitamins? in the water um yeah just let me know what you're thinking let me know what you're thinking um my veiled chameleon has puffy eyes on both sides any ideas oh well that's a 
totally different topic here. Um, but puffy eyes, it, you know, that, that really depends on what it is. And uh, that could be so many different things. Uh, yeah, I'd have to go through a whole list of how quickly did it, did this come up? Can he still see? Uh, is there any apparent discomfort? Uh, puffy eyes tend, could be a bacterial infection on the inside, but on both sides, leading me to believe it may be something else. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a real uh, digging down deep into a lot of different questions as to what it could be. Uh, thing with the eyes, there's so many things that affect the eyes. And so when the eyes have issues, you can't just say, okay, it's this. And uh, you go on social media and people love to say, oh, closed eyes. All right. Dehydrated or sunken eyes, dehydrated, closed eyes, stress. While those dehydration does cause sunken eyes and uh, stress does close closed eyes, there's so many other things that do both of those that you can't just make a quick determination. There's a lot of questions that need to be uh, need to be put in uh, put in uh, asked. But um, it's definitely something that you need to uh, keep an eye on. And if it if it came up quickly, uh, consider that it could be a bacterial infection. If it it came up slowly, there may be something else. Um, but if it's if it's getting worse, it's worth a vet visit. That's that's the thing. If it's getting worse, impeding, especially if it's impeding uh, his ability to eat, definitely get a, a vet visit. And if it doesn't go away after a little while, uh, definitely a vet visit. Uh, it's always worth it to go in and check it out. And the absolute best news that you can get is that you overreacted. I always love it when I uh, the vet tells me, don't worry about it. It's nothing. Uh, I, I am very happy uh, to have, uh, quotes, wasted a trip. Uh, but it's a, it's a good that's a good outcome. It's better than him saying, oh, okay, yeah, you got a real problem. So now one thing with these cages is uh, someone noted before that there's no visual, uh, visual uh, barrier between them. Um, you know, with, uh, with babies, it's not as important, but uh, I will put shade cloth. Uh, when I'm outdoors, I don't use, like using Coroplast as a visual barrier because uh, it impedes airflow and we want we definitely want airflow outdoors this is where the screen cage is i mean there's no substitute for a full screen cage outdoors uh, you want that airflow and what i'll do is i'll use shade cloth and that gives me the airflow uh, and I'll even like if it's a 70 percent shade cloth or 50 or 70 percent i'll i'll double or triple uh, layer it and uh, put it on the side of the cage. Um, let's see. Okay, Colt has been to three exotic vets. This is on the chameleon eye problem. Dealing with a set, okay. That is strange. Yeah, I'm not gonna be able to, wow, that is strange. Uh, Three exotic vets, tried antibiotics, antifungal, dealing with this since last Halloween. That's all right. Uh, you know, some the vitamin A deficiency can start. I, it doesn't cause the eyes to blow up. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Don't know. Don't know what to say on that. So let's see. Fajark, who says... Keep all my chameleons in outdoor cages. Still don't understand why sometimes they bask till they overheated. Live in Java Island, Indonesia. Yeah, that's it's a strange thing with chameleons that they don't seem to have a great judge of when things are too hot. And uh, don't know why that is, but they will uh, in literally burn themselves and keep basking. So yeah, chameleons, there's, there's something... That doesn't work with chameleons when it comes to uh, temperature. Just maybe some cues that they take that we're not giving them. 
Uh, so that there's, I have yet, I don't know why, and I have yet to hear an explanation that makes any sort of sense. Okay, guys, Demon's saying, okay, this is where we're talking about the liquid vitamins. Have a plant dripper and my chameleon drinks from it. I was curious if there was a liquid vitamin I could put in it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there is. Although you'd have to ask yourself if you really want to do that uh, because you have a lot less control over how much is drank. But I suppose if you see them drink, I guess the uh, the right answer here is for me to say, I don't know. I've never tried it. And I, uh, I haven't even, I haven't looked into liquid vitamins. I know they exist, so you could try it, but, um, yeah, you, you'd want, I don't know the effects of putting vitamins in waters. If there's any side effects as far as, uh, uh cleanliness, hygiene. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just going to have to say, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Um. Yeah, Colt, uh, sometimes it's just so hard to figure out what's going on with chameleons. And when the vet can't figure it out and other people can't figure it out. I mean, every chameleon, every body is different, just like humans. And they react differently. They're, I mean, they could have an allergy. Literally, the chameleon could have an allergy. Maybe that's what we're dealing with. And so it's... <laughs> It's it's uh, there's some so many things that we don't even think about that it could be. Hmm. So, question for everybody here as we're closing in to the end of our hour: Are you planning at all on having baby chameleons at any time? Either one because you bought an egg or. Uh, you've got a Jackson's chameleon uh, that may have babies, or you've got eggs, uh, eggs getting ready to hatch. Um, how many? How many of you out there actually plan on having uh, any interaction or any care for a chameleon less than three months old? I'd uh, um, be very interested in uh, hearing. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Because when I was going into this, I realized. How many people really would deal with baby chameleons? Now, you use all of this for adult chameleons, but what I've shown here is uh, very much optimized for small size. You can, of course, scale it up, but it doesn't work as well if you scale it up to a two by two by four foot tall cage. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there we go. I... Jennifer takes in baby chameleons as rescues. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, when you're doing rescue type work, you, you need to be ready for all ages. Definitely. Power Hustler says, me and my girlfriend are jumping in deep to breed chameleons. We're dedicated to this and love these animals. Okay. Just go slowly. Just go slowly. Okay. Uh, it's very easy to overwhelm yourself at the beginning. Uh, so many people, they do their first clutch and they love it. And then they breed 10 females. And, uh, and then they tell us how many eggs they have in the incubator. And then once those eggs hatch, it all falls apart because they weren't ready to take care of 300 babies. And nobody is. It's a ridiculous thing to do. So do yourself a favor and only breed the amount. Like if you, if you think you can handle 30 babies, breed one female. Uh, don't breed two females until you know you can handle 60 babies. Uh, and that's, uh, it takes a lot of self-discipline, but I can tell you right now, that is the way to keep it fun. Because once you get to overwhelming yourself, it, it's, it's a nightmare. It is truly a nightmare. And don't do that to yourself as it's so easy to do because you can have, you can have easily get five females you have one clutch and you just hold back the females and maybe you have 15 females uh, all you have to do is breed all those 15 females and you will literally go crazy and uh, we, we lose a lot of people in the chameleon world because they get overwhelmed after being enthusiastic in their breeding so know your situation 
you, you may know all of this, but uh, I'm speaking to the general public there. Um, Leaf Rise wants to breed for hybrid. Oh, yeah. Leaf Rise wants to go for the Panther Ustaleti hybrid. So uh, we'll watch. Want to see if you're successful? Let me know. <laughs> uh, they are interesting creatures. Emerald Garrett, heck no, you don't want baby chameleons? What? Oh, I got it. But I got to tell you, it's a whole lot more fun when you have one baby chameleon. When you have 30 baby chameleons, yeah, that's fun, but it's crazy. So uh, uh, I actually, you know what I love to do? I love when I know breeders in my area and I say, just give me a baby. Just give me a, a baby that has hatched and I just want to raise up that baby. And um, it's a once you, if you have one baby that you can uh, totally uh, spoil, give them this 30 inch tall cage and just concentrate on that one baby instead of all the 30 running around. Uh, it's so much more enjoyable. So and it it's actually easy. Chameleons kind of take care of themselves if you just give them the, the environment they need. Hey, Power Hustler says about the uh, the breeders that I'm talking about. Yeah, it is nuts. And and literally, I, you know, how we know that we are about to lose a breeder is when they brag about having 300 eggs in the incubator. Uh, I've got 300 eggs. Oh, boy. Um, we know they're about to implode. Um, so let's see. Power hustler saying, want to be a herpetologist when I was younger. So it's refreshing to enjoy just taking care of them so much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh taking care of reptiles is so much different than studying reptiles. And, uh, th this is the enjoyable definitely the enjoyable part the log loves the channel thank you log and i'm very glad to have you here and enjoying this um it's an interesting question my friend wants to use my male to breed with his female how old are they supposed to be uh it's really because it's really a size issue and how mature if they've got their mature colors um so whatever species you're talking about um just google or ask people ask breeders um people on uh, social media what does an adult look like so once they start having their adult colors that's a pretty good indication that they can breed and that's about as high levels i can get that will apply to uh, a lot of species, the different species. Uh, let that see. Pull to sing. I'd like to have baby chameleon, veiled chameleons one day, but I'm a few years off, I think. Oh, be careful. Oh, Colt, be careful. Uh, veiled chameleons, especially, uh, they tend to the healthy ones are doing uh, like 20 to 30 babies, but uh, captivity, they just explode in captivity. Uh, I've uh, 40, 60, even 100 babies. Oh, my goodness. It just gets crazy. And the problem is when you start to get such a huge clutch, you see them as a huge project instead of as individuals and you lose a little bit of what you really enjoy about keeping chameleons. And that's a trap a lot of us breeders fall into is we start concentrating so much on breeding and we get so involved in breeding that a year later we wake up and say, wait a minute, oh, this wasn't the fun that I remember it being why is it not fun anymore and it's because you made it a job whether you're making money on it or not it's once you have 30 babies it's a job and it will run you ragged taking care of it 
And so uh, the smart person really evaluates what it is that's making them happy and sticks with that. Sticks with that. I love breeding. And you know why I love breeding? Because I love raising up baby chameleons. But I specifically have chosen species that have, say, up to 12 babies or 12 eggs. That is because I know that's a lot much, that's easier to handle. I can take care of them better. And so that that's what I like. And when I'm doing species like, like I have a, some clutches of panther chameleons that I am, uh, that I'm doing, I've got, I wanted to, I got two clutches, a, a breeding two at the same time. So I will have probably between 40 and 60 babies. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to find a uh, select, 10 from each and then uh, find homes for the other ones. Uh, and of course they, they've got to be special homes of people who can raise babies up hatchlings. Uh, but you know, I, I have the advantage that I know a lot of those people so I, I can do that, but I don't want to raise up 60 babies. It's just not fun. I can do it. I know how to do it. I've done it before. I've had a large scale breeding facility before but it's not, it doesn't have that fun that I really like about uh, raising baby chameleons. And so when we go into breeding, the, the way to keep it fun, the way to keep it to where you enjoy it is to make sure that you stop before it's no longer enjoyable. So that's my insight here. MNG lol, hello, <laughs> saying hello. Um, And the question, what do I need to keep Parsons Chameleons? You need to understand Parsons Chameleons, go to a Parsons Chameleon forum and listen to people talk about them. You need to do, uh, you, you knew this was coming, do your research. Uh, I've got uh, podcast episodes with a, a breeder all about Parsons Chameleons. And uh, then you need to find one available. Uh, and you need to be able to maintain a large body chameleon, at least four foot wide cage by two foot by four foot tall. And bigger than that is better. Uh, I kept uh, mine in a walk-in enclosure. Uh, right now, he's in his uh, four foot by two foot by four foot. And that's because I've moved and I am building him a new walk-in enclosure. But that's that's the way that you truly can enjoy a Parsons chameleon is by making a walk-in enclosure. So, uh, you know, make sure make sure you're able to take care of them in a way. I know we all want a Parsons chameleon. We'd all love to have a Parsons chameleon. But if you can't take care of them in a way that really brings out how special they are, it's not worth it. Uh, if you can only have a two by two by four foot tall cage, I'd actually say don't get a panther or a veiled chameleon, get a carpet chameleon because you don't know how, I can tell you, you will see behaviors and it's a whole lot more fun keeping chameleons if they're in a relative, a cage that is large relative to their body size. Uh, you see behaviors, you're able to create microclimates. It's a whole lot more enjoyable experience. And Colt saying, like to raise veiled chameleons one day. Yeah, careful about veiled chameleons because um, they're just so hard. They're so pro prolific. You'll never recoup your costs. Um, you've probably put more money into a two-month-old baby than you will get out of, uh, be able to sell it for, so it's not really sustainable. And... Um, so it's it's tough. Veiled chameleons, they're they're incredible chameleons, but they're just too prolific. And they aren't they they should be they should be five hundred dollars. Uh they're an incredible chameleon. And I think them being sold for thirty dollars at a show is uh I'd love to outlaw it because it's, they're worth so much more than that. 
but uh, that's not the way we uh, choose prices for chameleons in our capitalistic society. Um, but just be careful about getting into breeding bailed chameleons. Jennifer saying, really miss my Honelli. Maybe I'll get another one one day, but it was so hard on me when he died. Yeah, we, we get attached to our chameleons and it can be painful. Um, I, I actually recently, I haven't said this anywhere, but I recently got into, I uh, had an at, ant attack that uh, actually got some of my chameleons and uh, emotionally, it's just really hard to take that loss. And uh, you really don't, uh, right now I don't, <laughs> I've, I've got that feeling of, I don't want any more chameleons and uh, which is probably healthy and that's where I'm going. But uh, yeah, it really socks you sucks you one when you lose chameleons especially when it's not to old age uh i was very sad when i lost my dermensis and my multiperculata that i have been with me for 10 years or so uh but when they die a natural death yeah uh, and you know that it's of old uh that's it's okay it's a lot better than 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 when it's a sickness or something that you've got to battle um, hey Jennifer, I kept my Unelli in a glass exoterra 36, 1836. I love it. Yeah, that's a great size for a Unelli. Great size. You can do a whole lot with that. They can have fun. Um, Bart asked, how old were those chameleons? I've had a ants in his cage, but they go for his food. Uh, yeah, it's small. Uh, I lost some uh, babies and uh, some smaller adults of smaller species. Um, but it's really about the size of the chameleon. Um, and the the ants aren't really going to bother the panther, the adult panther chameleons or the veiled chameleons. Uh, and they'll go for, and if they go for the food, you know, they, they don't bother the uh, the adult. But when the chameleon, when the ants can effectively swarm over the body then that's when it becomes a problem because the ants can really can just take them down uh, and i have tame ants compared to some areas you get in florida and texas you got some ants there that'll take away your house so uh, in a way i'm <laughs> even though i've uh I'm kind of sickened by what i just went through it's uh i don't have it as bad as other people do um so all right, my friends, we have come to the end of the hour. I want to thank you so much for joining me here. It is so much fun hanging out and doing chameleon talk. And I thank you everybody who has been in the chat and has brought uh, life to this, this chat. I appreciate it. I'm here, uh, here every let's see, next Saturday. I will not be here. Uh, next weekend is... Uh, uh, a special race for my wife. And then I'm actually on a plane. I don't like being on a plane these days, but uh, we're, we're going to try it. Um, and I'm going to be going to uh, uh, going on a trip. So wish me luck on that one. Um, so I want to say, uh, I'll just say bye. Uh, oh, you want to, uh, if you want to get at this, uh, find... First of all, the podcast. If you want to learn more about these cages, I did a whole podcast on uh, on that. Go to the chameleonacademy.com website. I mean, you just go to the product page. I have a uh, a player, a podcast embedded podcast player that you can just play the podcast from this website and uh, talk about the cages that I'm describing. And that's also where you can, um, if you want to do this exact cage i have a shopping list there that allows you to uh buy the exact the, the reptibris uh and the coroplast and the screws uh, of course you can use any cage any and get from your home depot um but if you want to get it all delivered to you the shopping list is there this template is on that web page and uh so you can uh, download that. You can print it out. Just make sure that you print it out with no scaling and one-to-one -one. and measure like the side panel. It says 16 by six 
inches. That's the size. And so uh, measure that. And if that's six inches, you're good. Uh, Leaf with Eyes is asking, what's next week's topic? I am continuing this topic, and we're going to be talking about screen uh, outdoor uh, project, an outdoor project for uh, uh, adult chameleons. I'm going to be uh, putting together a whole uh, build guide for those planter box cages that you see me with, where I have a a foot deep uh, planter box, and I have the cage on top of the planter box, and it's all on wheels, and I move them around. So it's essentially what we talked about today for adults. And I have uh, I have wanted to put together a build guide for that and plans and stuff so people can easily do that for many, many, many years. And it's time that I just said I'm doing it. So that, that's what next week is going to be all about. All right, all. Thank you so much for joining me here. And I will see you next time. I'll be uh, in. in I will be doing my Instagram live on Tuesday night at 5 p.m. Pacific time again. Till then, have a good week.